Good afternoon. My name is Eric Nietzsche. I'm a graphic artist and formerly the art director of General Dynamics. As many of you know, General Dynamics has a long-standing history of technological innovation for Cold War defense needs for the United States, with projects relying on the engineering, control, and recycling of energy for powering life support systems. The company prided itself on efficiently engineering defense solutions, while at the same time exploring new frontiers within and outside the bounds of our planetary world. Focusing on the development of the world's first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus, I want to highlight two closed worlds that are at once technical, political, and cultural. The first is its life support system, and the second is the intellectual property associated with its innovation. I'll describe my own experience as a designer in attempting to humanize these often contentious, contaminated, and unattainable closed worlds in order to gain public acceptance, enthusiasm, and participation in propelling innovation forward. This is a Dell Dynamics promotional video made for our corporate review. Our accomplishments, their diverse and their results, are all harmonics of one fundamental thing, the harnessing of physical power to technological skill. This concept has been the basis of our strength in the past and will be the foundation of our growth in the future. In aerospace, marine systems, electronics, and industrial resources, energy plus engineering equals general dynamics. Harnessing of physical power with technical skill. It was my job to create an image of this concept and to portray their faith in unlimited growth and progress. The company holds many patents for these products, and in many of these products, the role of the human as navigator, machine operator, made the integration of life support vital for inhabiting foreign territories, altitudes, depths, and atmospheres. Life support becomes a multifaceted operation, supporting the individual life of the pilot and the protection or potential destruction of others. The goal of the USS Nautilus, driven by President Eisenhower in the intellectual battlefield of the Cold War, was to build the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, one that would complete a voyage beneath the North Pole, sailing where no ship has sailed before. The sub needed to go anywhere beneath the surface of the sea, be invisible, undetectable, change depth quickly, and stay below for weeks or months at a time. This required innovations in power sources, sonar sensing, weapons delivery, navigation and communication equipment. It required life support systems capable of sustaining a large crew in a small and nearly closed ecology. How can a completely sealed environment protect not only one, but the lives of 100 other humans for days, weeks, or months at a time? The ability to travel long periods submerged without surfacing, while generating vast amounts of electricity for shipboard use, replenish oxygen in the closed atmosphere, and remove air impurities, these were complex and assumes no air, it was plentiful through distillation of seawater. The electrolysis of seawater provides an inexhaustible supply of oxygen. Wastewater was discharged into the sea, and solid waste dumped to the sea floor. The boat's reactors were surrounded by loops of piping in which water under high pressure would be circulated not only to cool the reactors, but also to transfer their thermal energy to heat exchangers, which would convert water into steam for powering the turbines. The essentially limitless supply of high pressure seawater outside the hull was simultaneously a life threat and a crucial external resource for survival. With an enclosed steam plant generating massive heat, air conditioning was required. To ensure good air quality, the internal environment needed air purification and monitoring, which the sub claimed to provide. However, the limitations of air quality control became apparent when the Nautilus was put to sea for testing prior to its journey under the North Pole. Carbon dioxide was not sufficiently removed. Refrigerant gases leaked from equipment and were decomposed into acid gases, causing submariners throat, 
eye and tooth irritation. The life support system didn't anticipate that the crew would be painting while underway. Inevitably, VOC concentrations were high due to off-gassing of paints, electrical components, and construction materials. As a result of these early tests, more comprehensive air purification equipment needed to be installed to facilitate longer dive times. So much so that the historic transit of the Nautilus under the polar ice cap actually relied on emergency breathing air and oxygen masks to avoid exposure to highly contaminated air. But once the internal causes of poor air quality were better understood, it was believed that water, air conditioning, and spacious living areas made the Nautilus the most human-friendly um, boat in history. The only danger when making its trip under the Arctic ice was if she had to winter over for some reason and the crew ran out of food. The boat's essentially limitless power for generating oxygen and potable water made her the most advanced warship in history. The development of this warship was top secret. As Cold War tensions began to escalate, General Dynamics was capitalizing on the American policy of nuclear deterrence. But John J. Hopkins, its president, wanted a graphic identity that casted General Dynamics as an arbiter of peace and prosperity, not war and destruction. He argued that the company was in a position to benefit mankind through scientific research. And he understood that presenting a good public face was endemic to this goal. My first project for General Dynamics with only a few months' notice, was to design the company's ex exhibition for the International Conference on the Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy in 1955. But since our atomic projects were top secret, we had almost no material that could be shared with the general public. I was forced to find a way to express the company's mission with only the vaguest suggestion of actual products. In the absence of their so-called products, symbolic expression of the corporate mission was the only real option. So I needed to develop a graphic means to present peaceful uses for the atom. This was challenging not only because of the closed nature of the proprietary information, but also that the very technological advancements of the company were potential threats to the existence of mankind. The deep-seated aversion to submersibles and to the technology that drove them, it had to be reversed, simplified, humanized. My solution was a symbolist, symbolist graphic presentation of peaceful uses of the atom, called Atoms for Peace. I suspected that this European cr crew would be drawn to the medium of posters. I created designs that were printed in multiple languages, representing different fields of general dynamics, scientific, and technological research. Combining influences from modernist fine art and scientific imagery, this futuristic aura suggested general dynamics products as well as its progressive aspirations. The most well known of the series was a painting of a Nautilus shell with a nuclear submarine shooting out of its chamber. The shell was a virtual cornucopia of progress. The submarine was not seen as a killing machine, but rather the offspring of progress, poised to help the world, a gateway to the energetic seas. I was working with fantasy, with an idealistic image of the future in which we are more or less involved. In the end, my work envisioned a clean, peaceful, technocratic, atomic future that never quite arrived. It heroicized this world, these lethal technologies, though I can see how in retrospect people view this as propagandistic imagery. But at the time, we truly believed it. Part of this fiction that's created is that it's a closed world, when in fact it's supported by a vast network of supportive infrastructures, the US tax system, intellectual capital, huge expenditures of energy. Here we see a supposedly closed world of the Nautilus, surrounded by the pageantry that keeps it alive. These closed worlds are in fact very porous, involving a number of inputs and outputs, and exposed to many actors. The closed world of the Nautilus sub, in protecting its crew, relied on the external pressures of the sea, but failed to fully understand the multiple sources of air contamination, including the crew members themselves. In protecting the closed world of the Nautilus, a parallel, top secret, proprietary information world developed with its own pitfalls, risks, and leaks. Its purpose is for defense, yet it suggests potential destruction of a world beyond itself. 
closed worlds, while internally functional, seek to explore, colonize, and conquer outer worlds. They require a faith that they work. They're dependent on fantastical imagery. Design is a vehicle for creating these images. But as designers, we sometimes make assumptions, oversimplify their inherent complexities to the point of absurdity. Diagrams or equations like the one we saw earlier, energy plus engineering equals general dynamics. Yet, those are necessary fuel in the pursuit of closed worlds. Rather than devolve into the abyss of closed, solving closed worlds, or proceeding as though they're neutral ground, we should recognize that they inevitably leak, tear, and erode. And instead of viewing these leaks exclusively as threats, we can examine them as resources and opportunities. As someone of an outsider, I could be viewed as a potential leak to the closed, proprietary, cultural world of general dynamics. But it's a delicate balance between maintaining this closed world of intellectual property and the beneficial flow of ideas and the production of new knowledges. Danke schön. In 1969, I just walked on the moon. As you can see, it was just one small step for me, but a giant leap for mankind. Um, and uh, that's my home. Uh, and this is, this is a conference on the closed world. I want to point out to you that was uh, indeed the closed world for me. I lived in there for some period. Um, let's see if it goes forward and backward. Um, I want to stress that this was actually a very hard period. Uh, it was a difficult time. Um, just before we left, where I got the very sad news that the first American troops were withdrawing from Vietnam. That, of course, was devastating. Um, people with long hair uh, refused to work. Um, they would stay in bed all day um, while we would risk our lives going to the moon. Uh, and at the Zip Zap Music Festival in North Dakota, just before we left, um, People, there were riots, and people were dancing in the street um, to rock and roll. And thankfully, the National Guard did a great job in keeping things calm and clear and solving that music festival. Um, there were also uh, urban riots black, in the black neighborhoods of York in Pennsylvania. And again, thankfully, the uh, police managed to keep York uh, calm and clean. Um, so, uh, 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 so the Apollo 11 Earthrise image, as you see here, um, rep represented hope in this very hairy and troubled world. Um, it was a dream of an, um, of an enclosed world without any political borders inhabited by one human family. Um, it was a dream, of course, that represented the superiority of the United States of America um, in a world divided by Cold War tensions. Um, I'm very proud to wear the same jacket thing here that you see here. Um, now, the story I would like to uh, uh, argue today, today um, is that the spaceship Earth you see here, up here, resembles the spaceship I traveled in. Um, the Earth you see in the back has to be understood by, this, uh, uh, by the spaceship you see in the front. And all the environmental and social problems I just pointed to of the Earth were due to humans not behaving, frankly, uh, like the way I was living within the spaceship capsule. 
To me, environmental ethics, for example, is an issue of trying to live like the astronaut, live like me. If everyone were just like me, the world would be in ecological harmony. Or at least, that's how I would like to argue. Here we go. Uh, if people just adopted my ast astronaut lifestyle using space technologies such as bio toilets, solar cells, recycling, and energy saving devices. You see, the technology, terminology, and methodology developed for spaceships should become tools for solving environmental problems uh, on board spaceship Earth. Our, Ap our, our Apollo 11 spaceship. Uh, which you see here on the left, is the rational, orderly, and wisely managed contrast um, to the spaceship Earth, which is irrational, disorderly, and ill-managed in comparison. Um, and I think if only the Earth could be managed by NASA, nobody will be laying in bed all day, letting their hair grow and play guitar. <laughs> So uh, we at NASA are so grateful to the ecologist who helped us build the environment inside the spaceships. Here you see one of their proposals for a lunar base from 1963 supported by a general life support system. Notice this, these words here. Um, complete with charts for circulation of oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, waste, plants, animals, and the astronaut. So that's, that's me over here. Basically, this chart here is the circulation for uh, my home up there. There were about 200 ecologists actually working on this. So this was uh, not a small little thing. This was the uh, thing for the ecologists at the time. Um, so the space's research was sponsored by our deep friends uh, in the military who argued that closed ecosystems were important for the construction of fallout shelters. So in case of the evil communists would come, you know, I would live down here with the presidents and all the other VIPs people, and we could survive there for years in this closed ecological system. Spaceship engineering is also relevant for surviving weeks, months, or perhaps years in submarine, uh, in submarine in case, again, those evil communists attack us with nuclear weapons. Um, we at NASA, we are also behind the new green technologies, such as the first boom of the solar cell industry. Here you see President Jimmy Carter um, inspecting the first generation of solar cells installed at the White House in 1979. Unfortunately taken down by Ronald Reagan, but that's a different story. <laughs> now, my life as an astronaut has always been uh, the model for architecture. Um, here you see a proposal from the Grumman Air Aircraft Engineering Corporation for a new household system modeled on the lunar model I used to land on the moon. It, includes, uh, it included a waste disposal system inspired by my space uh, recirculation technology, a sewage system inspired by my toilet um, the I used in space, and, a, and an energy efficient system for homes that incorporate solar cells. The suggestion for a system of water circulation within a home, for example, was basically an earthly version of the water circulation system within my spacecraft. So here you see they're applying um, the water circulation from my spacecraft to a potential home. And notice that it's published in Architectural Design, you know, one of the sort of leading journals at the time, I believe. Um, now this, of course, caught attention for the architects. To your left, you see Alexander Pike's model for circulation of water within the autonomous house from 1972, which is, which is modeled on water management on board my spaceship. Uh, and to your right, you see a similar water management project built by the so-called new alchemists uh, in the, in the mid-1970s at the Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Um, among those alchemists, you also find Bucky Fuller, who I believe uh, we have the honor to meet here today. It's really exciting. Uh, Bucky, you were also spied by NASA. That's great. Uh, <laughs> indeed, uh, it's a pleasure for me seeing so many books in the green design inspired by the ecosystem within my spaceship and Apollo 11. Um, especially this one over here. Uh, which, of course, was the standard introduction to ecological design for almost a decade. 
Um, and here's another great, uh, um, and here you see a standard textbook in ecology inspired by Apollo 13, which was also a great sp spaceship, by the way. Notice that ecologists even use our terminology, um, our life support systems. So here I asked you to notice that term, and it appears this in the textbook in ecology. Um, and if you go over here, you see uh, prologue, the flight of Apollo 13, the countdown, the explosion, and talk about the spacecraft versus uh, 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 Earth as a life support system. And here you see uh, the different parts of the Earth being discussed as if it's different part of the spaceship. So I think it's great to learn that the, our spaceship, my spaceship, has inspired a way to understand the entire Earth. Uh, and it's used as the standard textbook for ecology, and this is 1993. Um, I know this guy called Peter Anker actually had to use that textbook context. Anyway, um, ah, here's another great NASA project initiated by my friend, the professor of physics at Princeton, Jared O'Neill. Uh, a great picture of his, of his idea for an ecological space station uh, published in a lovely magazine, by the way. Um, And here you see uh, O'Neill and my friends at NASA's proposal for a new space station. It's like a Noah's Ark taking an intact ecosystem into the space from the polluted Earth. I, I wanted to bring the Bible and, and quote from, uh, from this section. For those of you who are not, and you should be, of course, readers of the Bible, we noticed that the story of Noah, um, he is taking two species. There's a flood, and he takes two species from all the animals. He takes it into an ark, and he saves them from destruction. And that's exactly what we try to do at NASA as well. Um, uh, and NASA will, of course, only take species that will be a pleasure to us. Uh, and only those who would be of necessary for complete ecological chain, while annoying scavengers such as wasps and hornets would stay on Earth. This is a complete ecological, ecological harmony in outer space. So um, it's kind of hard to read. Uh, here you see a big glass window, and you have to imagine this thing rolling around like this, creating artificial gravity out in, in outer space. Um, here's a tent. Here's some guys, uh, as a woman in, in a bikini, and a guy, and a baby, and they're swimming here. And this is a river running. Um, and here, something looks like San Francisco to me. Um, beautiful environment up. Uh, and, uh, um, and I'm also very glad that those hairy hippies liked the idea of immigration to a closed world in outer space. So this is edited by Stuart Brand, the, uh, 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 the famous uh, counterculture organizer. Uh, he had a whole volume in a journal. This is a part of a journal called Coevolution Quarterly, which was the counterculture journal at the time. And they liked this space colony. So the space colony you see here, the round system is the, is the one that you see rolling around like this. So we, that picture is from inside this thing. Goodbye, Earth. People say, oh, we have, we have only one Earth. That's, of course, not right. We can make our own Earth. Um, indeed, the royalties from the whole Earth catalog edited by Stuart Brand was used to research how to build a space station. And, uh, and the catalog has plenty of suggestions for how to build close ecological autonomous homes in, on Earth. And I understand that, uh, that Lydia Calipoliti has made a whole exhibition documenting these efforts. Thank you so much, Mrs. Calipoliti. All right. Um, uh, that, uh, let's see, uh, that, w that one could use the science of, the of ecology to colonize outer space and thus generate better understandings of spaceship Earth was endorsed by leading ecologists such as Dorian Sagan and Lynn Margulis. Lynn, Lynn Margulis, I'm sure you know, was the, one of the co divisor of the Gaia theory. Um, and, and this book with a telling title, Biosphere from Earth to Space one of my favorite books. Um, it inspired the Biosphere 2 project in Arizona. Um, and they wanted to prepare for an ecological colonization in outer space by making a prototype space colony here on Earth. Um, the building was sealed to protect the ecosystem from within, uh, from, um, uh, from the outside environment. It was completed in 1991 and sealed after eight biospherians, that's what they call themselves, uh, dressed in spacesuits and marched through the airlock. They wanted to show how to colonize other planets or survive ecological catastrophes on biosphere, Earth, biosphere one, which is the Earth. Uh, I can just imagine here Abigail you know, talking into the microphone, something like this. This is Abigail, a control tower. 
control tower, this is, uh, you know, uh, a control tower, please, uh, more water for the tomatoes, <laughs> click, you know. So it's like this very technological informed way of, of thinking about ecology. I'm sure she wants to be an astronaut just like me. All right. Um, uh, so, all right, so let's summarize. Um, I have, as an astronaut, played a key role in shaping our shared environmental concerns. I have been a great hero across different political spectrums. Um, even hippies like me. It is through me that we have learned to appreciate biocentrism, unlike that, opposed to that evil-centered uh, anthropocentrism. Um, as an astronaut, I lived in codependent harmony with, uh, with a closed ecosystem on the spaceship. Um, it was thanks to me we learned about the caring capacity and later sustainability of spaceships, spaceship Earth. As these concepts pointed to the critical load of astronauts within a spaceship before, the, uh, before its ecosystem would uh, become out of balance. So how many astronauts can you take into a spaceship uh, or how many uh, people can you have on Earth? Those are the same type of, of problems. I've also, um, I've also been a model for how to live with new emerging environmental technologies. My home in outer space became a model for architects' green buildings, equipped with spaceship um, water and air recycling technologies, as well as solar cells. I have as an astronaut also given uh, you that view of Earth from the outer space that has enabled all of you to think and act globally uh, on environmental issues. And, and next time you play around with Google Earth, remember that it's my eyes you're using. I am the one looking when you zoom in from outer space in Google Earth. As long as you use that program, I will always be part of you. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's like one, it, it was one small peak for me, but it's one giant gaze for mankind. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Prior to commencing extravehicular activity, a crew member will remove his constant wear garment and don the liquid-cooled undergarment. The cooling garment will be worn under the pressure garment to carry off the astronaut's metabolic heat. In an early test under lunar gravity conditions, a subject wearing a developmental pressure garment tried to weigh himself from a backfilling position while wearing an early model of the portable life support system. The test revealed that an astronaut could not get to his feet while wearing the particular backpack design. That's such a hard act to follow, Neil. It really is. Uh, but I'm actually very lucky today. I'm not playing a role. I'm not trying to inhabit someone's character. I'm not even trying to represent an institution. I actually get to be myself, albeit my much younger self when I was starting as a mechanical engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. To give you a little context, I was at NASA when what is known as the worm logo on the right was being used. Uh, the so-called meatball logo that we see on the left both predated and postdated my three years there. And to help you visualize a little bit about my life there, here I am working at a vibration laboratory where we subjected satellites to intense vibrations to simulate launch conditions. On the right, I'm plugging in an accelerometer into a sounding rocket. I have to say that's not how I typically dressed. These were photos for a publication showing what female engineers did at NASA. And at that time, I was required to wear a dress for that. Um, you know, they were expected to wear dresses and skirts, although I normally worked in a laboratory. I usually had a reprieve, but not for any kind of official photo for that. Uh, this next image, which was a few years later, was taken by a colleague. I'm in my regular attire here, usually a tunic, such as what I'm wearing now, and pants not just like these, but these actual pants. <laughs> I still wear them. I still like them. I just can't button the top button anymore. <laughs> So in this lab, I'm working on a laser optic system that we were going to deploy underwater to collect reference data for the Landsat satellite. Jacques Cousteau, 
who's going to be following me on the stage, was our partner in this mission. He towed the instrument we designed behind his boat, the Calypso, off the coast of Florida. Just outside my office door was this poster. Indeed, this poster appeared in many of the 35 buildings across the Space Center. While it is the stuff of cheesy affirmations today, this quote from Robert Browning was for us the sine qua non of space exploration. It was about what lay beyond the limits of our corporality. This light motif is why so many of us felt that July 20th, 1969, sucked all of the air out of the room. Don't get me wrong for this. You know, as a teenager, it was one of the defining moments of my life uh, to see um, uh, the moon landing, one of the reasons I chose NASA to start my career. And Neil, I just wanted to be you that day. That was my dream. But the public frenzy and fascination that the MAN program generated tended to push to the background everything else that NASA was doing, and it continues to do so to this day. Today, no longer wowed by a man on the moon or a woman in the space station, the public and our government are now pushing for manned flight to Mars, as if to say that NASA is only relevant when it enables an American body to occupy new territory. All of this in spite of the fact that we did land on Mars in 1975, and we have had a mission on Mars operating continuously and successfully for the last four years. It may just be a piece of equipment for you, but for us, this is where the real science has been taking place. For many of us at NASA, manned flight was a distraction to serious space exploration. We weren't interested in breaking the bounds of terra firma. We wanted to break the bounds of our own body. To be able to see beyond what our eyes could see, to be able to touch beyond what our hands could reach. We didn't see ourselves as a subject in some human-centered universe. Indeed, it would have been anathema to even think that the universe was small enough and noble enough that the human body is capable as, as serving as its data. If I think about all the projects that I worked on during my few years there, the vast majority of them, including all of the satellites I worked on, had booms and optics. The boom is essentially an extendable arm held tight to the body of the satellite when it launched, different booms would extend when orbit was reached, some to enfold photovoltaics at the perfect angle, some to position scanners and detectors, some to assist in positioning the satellite itself. The optics were all about transmitting, receiving, and processing light and other radiation. As such, the booms became our arms, and the optics were our eyes. This very lack of corporality gave us an unprecedented window as an observer that no human body could ever achieve. I hesitate to call them our avatars because the data that was collected has no relevant translation to what any one body could perceive. This is what made them so remarkable. These very discreet extensions opened portholes into a scene of unimaginable depth. As such, we were flooded with information with no constituent framework through which the data could be positioned and therefore understood. Our equipment collected photons. Most of our equipment just collected photons. But how does one know if a photon that strikes a detector was emitted a millisecond ago or a million years ago? In space, you must know when something is in order to tell where it is. This was my first introduction to Lagrangian coordinate systems. Cartesian coordinates allow us to map every aspect of our Earth. An objective datum is established gravitationally, and once in place, we can use any number of methods to determine dimensional relationships. Lagrangian systems, on the other hand, accept that objectivity does not exist. Instead, origin is assigned to a moving thing of interest. Dimensional relationships between the thing of interest and its surroundings are entirely contingent on the behavior of the thing itself. As a result, one can't know where something will be in the future without knowing where it was in the past. And to make it much more complicated and complex, we also need to know what it was doing in the past. That still doesn't mean that we know what it will do in the future. 
the best we can hope for is to be able to speculate on an array of possible futures for the thing. So what was key for us at NASA was negotiation between objective and subjective frames of reference. We looked to establish footholds. They could be physically deployed from Earth, such as satellites, orbiters, landers, sensor pods, or informationally related to Earth, such as space objects positioned less than 400 light years away. In both ca cases, we could map these footholds objectively in Cartesian coordinates. The footholds then became discrete origins in Lagrangian systems, which then relationally collected data from their surroundings. And a way to think about this is to imagine reaching into that infinite porthole and taking out a tiny scoop. We didn't think of that scoop as a microcosm of the universe. We didn't even imagine that if we took out enough scoops, we could extrapolate to form some generalizable understanding. Each scoop for us was but an instance, an autonomous instance. Establishing all of these footholds was not meant to map space as if it were a dimensional entity, but rather to see space as, a, as if it were, and as it was, an array of behaviors. Perhaps the most unearthly part of this was a denial of connectivity. We had no intention of creating a worldview of the universe or of constructing an integrated model of cosmic relationships. We wanted to be able to understand just one instance, one transient moment, and understand it very, very well. Indeed, that's why we're all there to begin to understand things we had no awareness of even existing before. Perhaps of all the concepts that I learned in my time there, the one that was the most formative in my own development was this very idea of disconnection, which occurred in two different ways for me at NASA. The first has to do with isolating phenomena. With the rings of data flooding in, you begin by looking for what doesn't connect, what doesn't fit. It. You look at what's moving in a different direction. Everything else then you treat as if it is just a quiescent field. We are looking for that one behavior that is the driver or the governor, and everything else gets neglected. It was an incredible way of simplifying what would have been an intractable problem. But it did demand that the scientists and engineers have the ability to reason out scenarios which in turn demanded remarkable aptitude and facility with the laws of physics. We unfortunately live in a world today where most practitioners are hoping that the answers will somehow emerge on their own if they keep collecting enough data. Whereas we were throwing away as much data as we could to get to the essential bits. The second way that this idea of disconnection occurred was in the making of equipment. Integration to us was a very bad word. When you designed a piece of equipment, you designed it to do a task in the most robust manner possible. Nevertheless, you still had to recognize that weight is the biggest enemy in space. You would think then that there would have been a push for multifunctionality as that would be the easiest way to get the job done and reduce weight. But this rarely happens as the entire mission is worthless if the job isn't done properly. Furthermore, when things are multifunctional and integrated, then failures can start to cascade. When everything is independent, one failure is just one failure. The mission can go on until the last component fails. In 2001, I heard Daniel Golden, who was then the administrator of NASA, speak about the design for the Mars rover, which you're watching on this screen. He stated that it would be the most disintegrated lander that NASA had ever made. Even the wheels had their, would have their own motors and controls. Because of this disintegration, it could maintain some functionality even after multiple catastrophic failures. One wheel would fail, it would still move. Two wheels would fail, it would still move. Three wheels would fail, it would still move. Not very well, but it would still move. Everything was engineered for optimal performance of its task. Everything was engineered independently and discreetly to protect the mission. And interestingly enough, uh, the rover has already outlived, long outlived its expected life and is still collecting data. 
When I think about our unrelenting commitment to clumsily integrate all of our building systems together, because that is, on the one hand, supposedly good engineering, and on the other, holistic, I think the aspect we could learn most from NASA's approach is perhaps not so much about the failure issue, but rather the idea of optimal design for a specific task. Instead, we do a lot of tasks in buildings quite badly because we collapse them all together into a single closed system. So Neil, I'm talking to you now. When we think about the public's image of NASA, it is completely circumscribed by manned flight. And the images they are most familiar with, the space suit, the space capsule, the space shuttle, the space station, all represent the NASA that was less about exploring the unknown and more about pandering to the narcissism of the body politic. All of these craft, with their many worlds carefully recreating the human body's known environment within a tightly sealed, highly integrated system, are the antithesis of what those of us in the other NASA were launching, which all of those things that we were sending out into space were about extending beyond rather than closing in. We wanted to transcend our bodies and not allow them to restrict our reach. So Neil, while I so wanted to be you before I started working at NASA, when I left, I wanted to be Billy Pilgrim. Thank you. Pressure molds are high grade steel, almost a half inch thick. There are four wide angle observation ports, three inches of solid plexiglass. They are submarines, but they are no ordinary submarines. Nor is their mission ordinary. So we created a new submarine with a smaller and stronger hull and sophisticated miniaturized machinery. The mini sub. The Loire enters the hatch to Calypso's observation chamber. It is in the bow, 10 feet below the water line. Down here, we can clearly hear the squeaks and clicks of the dolphins. Hello, um, I'm Jacques Cousteau from 1963. I'm very happy to be here with my fellow travelers and pioneers. Um, our structures are like a steel ball that hold down a big bubble of compressed air. Um, they're like a big cup turned upside down and pushed into a bowl of water. Although the ocean, oceanauts would like to forget their dependence on the surface, they must actually heavily rely upon them. So cables run from the ship above to support the station. Oops. I guess it's that way. Um, Calypso divers, um, like a human conveyor belt, bring all of our supplies um, down in pressure cookers. Every day we send up 40 empty aqua lungs to be refilled with compressed air. And every other day, the black masks use 110 pounds of chemicals to absorb carbon dioxide from our, our respiration. Um, and then the harmless waste is scattered into the sea, as you can see here. Inadvertently, too, then, we still have an impact on the environment around us. Um, so seaweed, for example, grows so quickly on the buildings that it must be scrubbed each morning. I just also want to say that when you wear flippers, it's actually really hard to stand up against a podium because your feet are too large. Um, <laughs> um, so, and ultimately, as you can see here, we left the carcasses of our own experiment behind. 
Um, it's like the trash left over from the Apollo mission, uh, which Neil, you might know, included things like more than 70 spacecraft remnants, five American flags, 96 bags of urine, feces, and vomit, empty packages of space food, and my favorite, um, a feather from Baggin, the Air Force Academy's mascot falcon, used to conduct Apollo 15's famous banner feather, uh, hammer feather drop experiment. Um, we also found that strange interdependencies would emerge. Um, we, couldn't, we can't remember if we are outside the aquarium or inside. Um, and inside this topsy-turvy world, we feed the fish rabbit meat. <laughs> um, we live with fish, but we open a can of sardines. In this somewhat careful balance of our closed world, um, we found that the hardest things to manage were in fact inside of us. Um, at the halfway point of our mission, for example, I took down some bottles of champagne. Um, and in the higher pressure uh, habitat, um, the bubbles actually failed to come out of the solution. The wine was as still as the world outside. And the pressure even made our tobacco um, burn twice as fast. Um, our sense of taste was altered. Um, we actually had very little appetite. Um, and it, to compensate, we would kind of put sauce on everything. We finished five bottles of ketchup every single day. Um, ultimately, though, um, it was really boredom and this kind of constant sense of dampness that was very wearing on us. Um, our sense of time became hazy, um, sun and shadow lost their meaning, and light would come from all directions. Um, our mission also revealed um, the need for people to be alone sometimes. Um, people must be able to seek sporadic privacy. Um, but even then, um, when alone at night, you know, I've been diving for 20 years, um, but even when I'm alone under the sea, I, I feel afraid. It is in the night that you see the strangest creatures, um, their shapes, their movement, um, their colors are stolen from nightmares. Um, challenging too, to the sense of a closed world, um, was a kind of tension that we constantly felt about whether we were scientists or whether we were explorers. Um, and I think ultimately this kind of desire for conquest um, kind of kept coming back for us. Um, we are, we were very proud to be um, pioneers in the conquest of the continental shelf, um, a worldwide submerged territory larger than Africa. Um, and we were moving um, man's homestead deeper into the sea um, as if to prove that it will become possible um, to systematically exploit the resources of the ocean. And now, um, thanks to this, thanks to our work, the occupation of the continental shelf has begun. Um, to give you a couple of examples, um, we took a census of a coral reef by dynamiting it, um, which if you ever want to take a census of wildlife is an excellent way to get a perfect cross-section of all of the fish in one area of a coral reef. Um, which you can see here. Um, but really, we also just had fun. Um, we, we rode on the back of tortoises. Um, we um, pet fish. We um, got to interact with these environments that we would never have otherwise been able to examine. Um, in strange ways, too, we were able to take our revenge on sharks who were attracted to a baby sperm whale that we accidentally killed with our boat's propeller. Um, and I won't mention that I also had to retire from um, the Oceanographic Museum of Monte Carlo when we actually killed a couple of dolphins trying to capture them to exhibit them. Um, so I think this kind of, um, um, I, I guess it's 1963, but if, if you saw me in a couple of years, I might start to feel a little bit of regret about these questions. Um, and maybe those those regrets can start to open up a discussion among all of us. Um, so I'd like to ask um, uh, Neil, Michelle, and Eric to join me up on stage. Um, and then I have a qu couple of questions to ask you.
So, um, can everyone hear me? Um, I think it's, I think there's a lot of debate clearly to be had amongst all of us and I'm hoping very much that we can try to kind of test some of the differences among all of us. Um, and maybe we could begin by this question of the role of the explorer, the kind of persona of the explorer um, that I think all of you touched upon so beautifully. And um, I know for myself, I feel very torn between my desire to kind of uh, celebrate this extraordinary kind of uh, environment that I was able to cross into at the same time, many years after all of the work that I've done, I've started to sort of, I've taken a lot of heat for the number of dolphins that I've killed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so I guess my question to you um, would be um, that I'm curious how we both, as Michelle mentioned, transcend our bodies. Um, but I'm also curious about how we transform them, um, literally that my red blood cell count changed every time I dove, or that my beard would stop growing when I went underwater um, for a long time, um, <laughs> uh, or that, that one could kind of model a body in the way that you describe, Neil. Um, so can you kind of point to some of the differences, that, that sort, of, sort of the stance that you hold and sort of try to tease out some of the differences among you? Well, I find it entirely natural that my body is a model. Um, uh, that's supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> the role of explorer seems to me, uh, politically at least, obvious. The, law, the role of the NASA explorer was to enhance, um, and, uh, and it's certainly my role as the explorer was to showcase to the world the greatness of the United States of America. Um, that's the political role of the explorer. <laughs> well, I find the, the, um, the fact that you're quite torn, I, I feel like I might be in the same boat. Excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as, as I mentioned, somewhat, I'm somewhat of an outsider, so I, I operated somewhat neutrally uh, within the realm of of the mission, not only of uh, representing general dynamics, but in uh, really making an argument for why exploration is a major part of, of its role. But I do, and reflecting now, and I think uh, I, I didn't think about it as much then, but I do think often about the life of the submariners and what, what their bodies um, needed to, how they needed to evolve in order to maintain life uh, below life without daylight for, for as long as they did. Um, and you know, the Nautilus was advertised as a very human friendly ship, but at the same time we see, you know, the, the sailors dr dr uh, drawing cartoons about the kind of devastating quality of, of life down there. Um, the fact that they couldn't breathe very well or everyone was getting ill. So I, I, I do wonder about the technology as an extension of the man of man of the human being and and its relationship to that I think is very interesting uh, whether it's a sealed container that is very inwardly focused or perhaps in the case of NASA or Michelle or Jacques um, a sort of um, extension or outreach in order to gather data and collect more information um, to bring within that world that's something that is is equally fascinating to me. I think the, the, the funny difference uh, for me in this is that none of us saw ourselves as explorers. Um, we did exploration. You know, we created things uh, that explored. Uh, we analyzed the results of that exploration, but none of us would ever think to call ourselves explorers. And that kind of dislocation, you know, between the subject and the object, I think is what separated these two sides of NASA, you know, the, the side that was all focused about human occupation and human territorialization, and those of us who were focused on gaining a greater understanding of the universe beyond. Uh, so I, I, it didn't even occur to me until you raised that question that I can't imagine that any of us 
at NASA, at, at the unmanned part of NASA, would ever have dreamed of calling ourselves explorers. And yet, one could imagine that's indeed what we were doing. Um, at, in the hopes of uh, pitting you against each other a little bit, um, <laughs> Neil, how would you speak to Michelle's argument? You know, what is she missing by not posing herself as an explorer? And Michelle, what is Neil? Uh, Avoiding or or, uh, or overdoing <laughs> in this in this sense of, in 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 the mindset of putting him posing himself as an explorer. Of course, I was an explorer. I'm still an explorer. Exploring is what science is about. Exploring is what NASA is doing. That's our mission: is to explore the universe and explore new possibilities for uh, mankind. Um, I think particularly relevant is the exploration of the human body and the machine and the way we interact with the machine. Um, these things, uh, you know, I, I can look out in this audience, I see people partly doing their iPhones and gathering their apps and, and playing around with machineries and that's exactly the relationship to machinery that we educated ourselves in having uh, among spaceships. So that's also a way of exploring, getting used to machines, being part of the machine, endorsed the computers, endorsed the machinery in order to um, survive. Um, so yes, I saw myself as an explorer, and I think that's um, at the core of what NASA has been doing and should be doing. Well, I, I still think that, that you know, hyper-focus on manned flight, on, on uh, uh, you know, finding some type of condition that man can exist off of the surface of this Earth is an incredibly narrow way of thinking about how one appropriates and how one begins to actually explore what is beyond. You're not exploring anything uh, when you go to the moon. You're exploring that most, the, the limits of what your container, uh, your body, your system uh, can deal with, but you're not exploring beyond yourself. You're not reaching beyond yourself. You're looking inward to what your body can do. And I think that's where that difference was, is that we were not about ourselves or our bodies. We were about the knowledge that could be gained, whether it was for our contemporaries, whether it was for uh, future contemporaries, whether it was even something that would be useful. We were always about gaining that knowledge that was beyond what would be appropriate through the, the vehicle, uh, through the shell, through the, the, the carcass of the human body. And that hyper-focus, I think, was crucial for these missions, especially as a submariner. You know, I never went down in, a, in the ship, but I imagine in order to go through the everyday knowing that you're in a warship that can destroy so many other lives, um, it's a psychological question about how to maintain that hyper-focus and maybe focus on the exploration rather than that potential destruction. And I guess if, um, if um, the role of, of any of us as single subjects might uh, uh, direct or, or kind of uh, call attention to, cert to a certain focus in our research, maybe the funding sources that we're working with have a greater influence in that mission than either any one of us four people had. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your funding sources, where they're coming from. Um, and I guess in the most cases, it's the military or um, Congress in some way, um, but how does the kind of public debate over funding, if if it regards the federal government or private um, capital as or private corporations as General Dynamics has, how does that influence the decisions that you make? And I'll just just offer to start that conversation that um, a lot of people don't realize that my work was funded by the petrochemical industry. Um, primarily, um, that nobody in the world would have enough money to send me down to Con Shelf. To, to form Conshelf too, except the oil industry, precisely because they wanted us to prove that workers could um, withstand the pressures of working underwater to build oil rigs at the base of the sea. Um, so I think for us, that really influenced our idea that we were trying to produce a, kind of a proof for man's ability to withstand this hardship. Um, but what were your priorities based on funding? Well. 
uh, much of the technology was funded um, and licensed by the U.S. government contracts, defense contracts, so a lot of that was in a way funded um, by the public, which creates a very interesting, um, I think, dilemma and, and part of the reason why the kind of image of the company became so critical, an image of peace and, and prosperity. Um, and, you know, in, in sort of exchanging information and, and diffusing information, even just within its own uh, closed world, I guess, the closed world of the company and within the contracts, um, you know, the selection of, of uh, resources and people become incredibly important. Um, how much information can you disclose? How do you know if you're p selecting the right resource to work on a project? These all became incredibly complex tasks within that um, infrastructure as well. So it's an enormous company um, with an enormous range of projects. So the intellectual property um, and the protection of that was, was uh, very difficult, I think, to understand and kind of con conceptualize um, so that the kind of dissipation of that information becomes um, a critical act or a variable, I think, as, as these things try to propel their information forward. Uh, just so I'm clear, I'm still speaking as my younger self, not my older, wiser self uh, that, that <laughs> <laughs> knows more about things. Um, but, um, you know, when I joined NASA, uh, it was uh, a few years after uh, the moon landing. And, you know, to see already uh, the types of cuts that were being made uh, as money was being shifted from one space center to another, uh, much of it to support um, what was to become uh, the shuttle program uh, later down the road. Uh, and, you know, that, that was something that for my colleagues and I was a daily situation that we dealt with. And it was one of the reasons why we felt compelled to develop something called the spin-offs program. Uh, some of you might have heard of the spin-offs program, but we were constantly trying to justify why we were there. People could understand uh, the moon landing. People could understand a space exploration, uh, manned space exploration. Uh, they couldn't understand a deep space probe and, and what the point of a deep space probe was, even insofar as that was some of the most uh, 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 technologically challenging and expensive things uh, that we were doing. Uh, so we were being forced constantly to justify uh, our existence, to justify it to Congress. Uh, so the spin-offs program was something that was developed to put a public face uh, on what we were doing. Um, in the last image that I showed uh, of that laboratory, the whole reason that was a project for Jacques Cousteau uh, was so that we could show how Landsat was helping uh, solve the problem of the red tide. Uh, that we could use satellite imagery to solve very practical problems on Earth. It was the same group that developed uh, 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 reflecting paint for highways. It was the same group that developed the pacemaker. Uh, so a series of things came out of that group. That wasn't our main intention, uh, but it was what we felt we had to do to show that there was some relevance to this what we thought of was this incredibly open-ended exploration that really was our main focus and our main interest. So um, all the funding I got, I got from the taxpayers, and of course I am incredibly grateful for what the Congress has given NASA. The, after we went to the moon, and they were serious, they said, okay, you went to the moon, now you've done your job. Um, mission accomplished, and there were serious cuts in the budget in 1972, I believe, um, which of course was most unfortunate. Um, uh, that caused uh, the Grumman Corporation to have to prostitute itself, um, selling its technologies to architects, um, <laughs> and trying to sort of apply its, its you know, know-how that should be used for further space exploration in in, in a desperate attempt to do things for housing on Earth, <laughs> I, I think that was most unfortunate. Uh, and I think we should raise the budgets radically. We should think we should go to Mars and explore these new territories. Um, and, and this type of sellout uh, to, to architects 
uh, was a bit sad to me. <laughs> um, do you have questions for each other, and are there uh, questions from the audience? Um, start there, and then. Um, I'm fascinated with what I just heard today. Um, I'm Bucky Fuller's daughter, and uh, your reference to Spaceship Earth, uh, which is a very powerful thing for him, um, is, is very important really for uh, us to understand his process and what he really hoped would be all of our process in a way. Um, he was a absolutely insistent that your knowledge came from your direct experience. He was very anti just uh, words tossed out and he, he it, it had to have an experiential base. And I was thinking today, as I haven't found myself before, that he was very, very, must have been, I didn't really have this conversation with him, now I have to do a lot of looking up on things, but uh, that he, when we finally succeeded in getting into space, this was an experience that he wasn't ever going to have. And I think it must have, um, excited him, challenged him, and I think, in a sense, the whole metaphor of his own thinking of uh, Spaceship Earth and that we all have the responsibility of uh, really um, mastering Spaceship Earth comes from that sense of what we have to do. We all have to be uh, preparing for our spaceship uh, uh, adventure, or uh, adventure is not the right word, it, it, depth experience, um, that, that that's really where uh, some of the important answers to our, uh, particularly our current situation, may arise from keeping that really in mind, the challenge the challenge of really taking ourselves into a new space, a new space where Spaceship Earth is going to work for us rather than uh, not, which is the situation right now. So uh, this was a, a very, very stimulating session. I thank you all. Thanks. Um, one thing I've been thinking while we're talking, while, while, while you're all talking, is uh, sort of about the discourse that you're using, the words that are coming out, and um, thinking about words like you know peace or uh, extension or limit or body, um, and sort of how that field of terms is actually coming from its own closed world that you were all working in, which I think some arguments have been made that that's the Cold War. Um, and what I find really interesting is that the words that you use, in the, and uh, exploration is a big one, right, are almost like um, ways of tunneling out of that flat field of the Cold War, let's say, which is bounded by annihilation. Um, but the terms and the efforts are sort of a fantasy of escaping that field. Um, so I'm curious how you all feel about that sort of paradox of trying to get away from the thing that enables uh, the very act that you're doing and defines the, the, the terms you use to talk about it. You know the famous image of Earthrise um, created that sense of hope uh, that you just talked about. Um, 
on the western part of the Cold War. On the eastern part of the Cold War, it created fear, surveillance. They can see us. The Americans can, can, can watch what we are doing. Uh, the image was incredibly scary. Um, and of course, I thought that was great to scare them a bit. But yes, these images are situated in the Cold War. Imagery becomes incredibly important here, and that's where you know my work came in as in a way where the posters became a sort of testing ground for for exposing those worlds, and I guess instead of words, it used symbolic imagery um, in order to introduce not only introduce the public to the technology itself, but then reframe what that technology was doing. It becomes an interesting, um, design becomes, has an interesting role there as a testing ground for, for um, allowing the public, making it much more accessible, these ideas, to uh, the public, and then asking the public to kind of reconsider, reframe what their preconceptions might be about some of these things. Um, flipping their, their ideas about uh, the war crafts and, and, and redirecting this focus. But design, as a, I think, as a, a test, a test bed in a way, becomes incredibly important here to, to uh, maintain those public images. I'm actually really intrigued by this question. I, I think as the only person speaking today who is also the primary source uh, for, for her material, just that distance that I have from it, um, which is 30, 40 years uh, distance from it, and the fact that I became an architect later, already sort of colors my framing of it, already sort of uh, disassociates the language of the time, and actually the language of the time was booms and optics. It wasn't sort of this idea of arms and eyes and avatars we talk about today. Um, but I'm, I'm very intrigued by that because I, it makes me wonder in terms of the fact that when I talk about subjective and objective today, subjective uh, frames of reference, objective frames of reference, uh, for me back then, it was quite literal. It was simply a mathematical transform. You know, it wasn't about understanding those types of relations, which I would not have understood had I not studied philosophy when I went, on, went into to, uh, uh, graduate school in architecture. So is it ever possible to sort of like dislocate yourself or displace yourself from the language of your experience, even when you're talking about your own experience? This I don't know. I think with um, me and my fellow, for, for me my, and my fellow di divers, um, the thing we enjoyed the most was the fact that we would go down to the depths of the sea and we would start to feel dizzy and confused because of the lack of oxygen and the pressure and the colors would emerge and the lights would emerge through the sea and this kind of completely disassociating quality of being underwater was in fact much more exciting to us than the idea of conquest or oil, oil drilling in itself and I think in many ways that reflects back on the world that we then return to and that we're, we might not be trying to escape it or um, um, kind of recover it, but we're actually just kind of disassociating it and sort of making it strange again. And for that, I think that for us, that was the kind of wonder that we felt at, at sort of in being immersed within this world. Um, so with that, that kind of heady <laughs> logic, I'll end the discussion, but thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> You won. You won. All right, we have like uh, ten minutes of break, and we will start with.